Rishi Sunak today giving a statement to the Commons, making it clear he will not hesitate to act against Houthi targets. And this is predominantly the Brits and the Americans attacking um, Houthi bases. And this comes on the day that another missile has struck a US-owned vessel off the coast of Yemen. The situation is pretty serious. I'm joined down the line by Rear Admiral Chris Parry. Chris, you know, OK, we launch a couple of strikes against Houthi targets, but it's worth reminding people that the Saudis have been attacking Houthi targets for years. This is not going to be a straightforward, easy win, is it? No, there's no easy win in uh, war nowadays, uh, Nigel. We, we've seen the dem democratization of violence and quite a lot of the technology that goes uh, with warfare. It's not the preserve of states anymore. And what you've got here is a terrorist group that's got access to the sort of technologies you expect states to deploy. Well, that's no surprise because they're being supplied by two states, China and Iran. Uh, and uh, it is a problem. However, I think you'll find the other night that the Houthis took quite a hit from the United States and from ourselves. We probably took out about a quarter of their capability. Um, and to tell you the truth, okay. the number of strikes reduced. They've been singletons. They haven't been multiple strikes like we've seen. We've shown them our power. And frankly, what we're saying to them is, you know, that's what we can do. If you want more of that, just carry on. I had a question, Chris, for you. Um, our NATO allies, France, um, have once again decided to take a very different approach to us. They will not get they will not involve themselves on these strikes against the Houthis at all. I ask you, are the French really military allies of ours? <laughs> French, um, when it's in their interests, are allies of us. You know, obviously within NATO, they're, they're pretty strong. And if we were attacked by what we call a pacing power or, or something like that, between Russia or China, then they'd be in there straight away. There's no question. Uh, they obviously have different interests to us. I think what is more remarkable, um, Nigel, is how feeble our other European allies have been. Uh, I mean, there's a reason for that. I don't think there's another European country that's got the capability to sit in the, in the front line right now. Uh, and at the weekend, I, I was bemoaning the fact that most of our European allies can't fight and won't fight. Um, so it's only really the Brits, ourselves and the French that can be there. The French are there, to be fair. They've got a, a fairly high priced frigate there that can shoot these things down. But you know what? The rest of our European allies haven't invested in the sort of technology we need to deal with this. That's why they're not there. It's not just a question of their political interests. No, and it raises the question, of course, about our levels of capability, doesn't it, Chris? I mean, you know, here we are getting involved in this with a Royal Navy that becomes physically weaker and weaker and with less manpower. Yeah, you and I have discussed before, Nigel, you know, the sea is the physical equivalent of the World Wide Web. But if we don't invest in our sea power, then we're not going to be involved in globalisation. And this is a time when the likes of Russia, China and Iran are trying to close down the world ocean, particularly the choke points that are vital to us. I think the government, to tell you the truth, I think the country is starting to get the message. And that sea blindness that we've seen in the past is starting to evaporate. You know, we're really good at this sort of thing. And our, our sailors have done really well in tracking the US in this. But the United States can't do it all on its own. Uh, and if you toss up the number of warships, for example, we've got in the free world, there's nearly a thousand of them. We need to actually consolidate and coordinate our efforts, to make sure that these totalitarian powers like Russia, China, Iran and North Korea don't get their way at sea in particular. Yeah, and talking of Iran, uh, Chris, you know, I wonder, are we really entering a proxy war with Iran? Is there a danger? of serious escalation in the region? I don't think um, Iran is ready for, to take on either the United States or, or the United Kingdom or anybody right now. They're going to continue to operate through their proxies, the Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah, and most recently, I think, South Africa, to tell you the truth. The South Africa is engaged in this sort of lawfare uh, against uh, Israel. That They're trying to extend it now to the United yeah. Kingdom and the United States. And we've got to accept uh, that we are in a proxy war already. We're in a low-level confrontation with Russia, China, Iran and North Korea. They're strategically competing with us in practically every area. We're going to see more and more of these proxy actions, more encounter actions 
uh, between our armed forces. Uh, and as long as the dots don't get joined up, we won't end up in a world war. But I'll tell you what, Nigel, it looks a lot like the tail end of the 1930s at the moment. The free world is having to confront fascism and communism again in reality. And I'm afraid to say some of the rhetoric, some of the uh, ca character of today's uh, sort of environment uh, replicates what happened in the late 1930s. Worryingly, I think you're right, Chris Parry. But thank you, as ever, for joining me on the programme.